All right. Uh, welcome everybody to this How to Apply for Farmer Rancher Grants webinar. Um, I'll just briefly introduce our panelists. We've got Wayne Martin from University of Minnesota Extension Alternative Livestock Program. Uh, Annie Claude from U of M Extension. She's our fruit production specialist. Uh, Kate Seeger is with the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture and Kate and Wayne are Minnesota SARE co-coordinators. That's Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. And then we have Noreen Thomas from Dowding Thomas Farm in the Moorhead, Minnesota area. And I'm Jane Jewett from the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture. We are going to go right ahead with Wayne Martin's presentation. Wayne, please go ahead. Okay. Actually, while Wayne is getting his uh, screen up, I will just mention that this webinar is co-sponsored by Minnesota SARE, the Sustainable Farming Association of Minnesota, uh, U of M Extension, Minnesota Farmers Market Association, Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture, and Minnesota Farmers Union. So thanks to all of our collaborators on this. So we'll talk about the end. Okay. Um, I thought I would just start out by introducing myself real quick. So I'm a University of Minnesota statewide extension educator for fruit crops. Um, and I, I was part of the asparagus project too, if anyone is familiar with that. Um, so I am going to spend a couple minutes talking about the Agri Sustainable Agri Agriculture Demonstration Grant, which is through Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Just to be clear, I am not an MDA employee. I work for Extension, so different organization. Um, however, I am familiar with this grant from helping different farmers apply for it. Um, and so I'm going to share a couple of slides that we got from MDA uh, to share with you today. So the Agri Sustainable Agriculture Demonstration Grant, this is one where I think it's a great opportunity for farmers to apply to if you're looking to try out a technique on your farm and you need a little bit of funding to do it. It's not a huge amount of money. Um, you can go up to 25,000 and well, I'll get, I'll get to that in a second. Um, but it's, it, it, the idea is to provide enough funding to try out a new technique uh, on your farm or a variety trial, something like that. So the goal of this project is to explore innovative on-farm research and demonstrations relating to farm profitability, energy efficiency, and environmental benefits. Uh, for sustainable agriculture. So what it's getting at is they're looking to fund projects that can help Minnesota farmers move towards sustainability. And that can mean environmental sustainability. It can also mean economic sustainability. And so that's why they include profitability in that equation. Some examples of the types of projects that have been funded are practices to improve soil health, um, thinking something like cover crops, crop rotation, um, use of manure sustainably, for instance, a conservation tillage, um, maybe some non-chemical weed management strategies, for instance. And then uh, another example is developing or improving marketing opportunities through things like season extension. Like maybe you wanna try out using your new high tunnel that you just built. Um, this grant is not going to fund the building of a high tunnel. Um, that's the difference. It's not going to fund those big capital expenditures, but if you just got a high tunnel and you want to experiment with techniques for growing things in your high tunnel, this would be a great uh, grant to look at for that. So the projects that have been funded are published every year in the Minnesota Department of Agriculture's green book that they put out. Um, so if you're like, well, what would a good proposal look like for this grant? You can go to the green book online um, and you can look at the, the projects that have been previously funded. So $200,000 total is available this year in 2020. Um, that means that they're trying to fund multiple projects with this uh, $200,000. So applicants can request up to $50,000, um, but if it's above $25,000, you're going to be providing a dollar for dollar match on that. So um, any projects below $25,000, you don't have to apply, uh, you don't have to provide a dollar for dollar match. So 
Uh, projects can last two to three years. That's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about what project you might want to apply for. And then a big part about this is that grantees must be willing to share uh, their project outcomes with others. So that means the point of this grant is not uh, for the, the benefit to be limited to your farm. The, the goal is to learn things about new innovative, innovative techniques or tools and then also go share that with other farmers who can also learn from it. So that's an important part of the grant and it's something that you want to write about in your grant application. How are you going to share your results with others? Uh, the application period is open now, so they are currently accepting applications. They have to be received by December 10th at 4 p.m. Central Time. So that still gives you plenty of time this season to apply. Um, if you look at this link here, that is the link you want to go to to find information about this grant. And at that link, you'll also find the call for proposals. That the call for proposals is what gives a lot of details about what the specific criteria are that they're looking for in this grant. You'll also find a link to the Green Book where all of the previous um, grants that have been funded in the last couple of years can be easily found and you can read about um, past grant applications. Something that I wanted to, I added the slide in um, because I wanted to make sure to mention this. This grant requires you to uh, include a technical cooperator or in other words, a technical advisor. So that means um, you as the farmer are writing the grant application and you're the one conducting the work, but you have an advisor to help you. Um, the advisor should be somebody, well, the advisor is someone that you choose and you ask them to be involved with the project. Um, and there's somebody who has an expertise in the area that you're looking to do research in. So for instance, if you wanted to do a project doing a, um, a raspberry variety trial, that's a recent example that someone had a project funded for. Um, I'm someone who you could ask to help out with that. If you are, um, my cat's on my uh, desk right now. Sorry, I'm <laughs> trying to get him to go off. Um, if your project has to do with soil health, maybe you ask someone from the soil and water conservation district in your area to be your technical advisor. So that's somebody who, they're not gonna be out at your farm every day or anything like that, but you can ask them to help you develop the experiment or the research that you're going to do. And you can ask them to help you figure out how to uh, collect your data and they might help you analyze the data. If you want to have a field day as your outreach component of the grant, but you've never done a field day, you can ask them for help with that as well. Okay, so this again is the, the link to look at for more information on this grant. All right, Wayne, let's see if we can get you back on. All right, so um, I sent uh, Jane a connection to them. They're in Google, Google Slides. And so she may be able to upload them now or connect to them and uh, show them. All right, can people see that? Yes. Yay. Okay, Wayne, I will advance them for you and you can just uh, do your talk. All right. Nothing will jinx a project like saying the technology is smooth and easy to work with, such as life. Yeah, so anyway, this is um, um, the main offices for North Central SARE. And again, as I mentioned, it's Sustainable Ag Research and Education. Let's go ahead with the next slide. One back. So Kate okay. Seeger and I are the co-coordinators co -coordinators for the state of Minnesota. So as you go through the process of filling out a, uh, a, you know, writing a draft proposal for a project, please feel free to contact us by phone or email, and we'll gladly review, uh, you know, any of the work that you've done. We'll talk about ideas about what may be appropriate or not for a grant. We're, that's our job. We're more than uh, willing to do so. So don't hesitate to contact us. Okay, next slide. And again, it's uh, grants and outreach to advance sustainable innovations in the whole of American agriculture. So kind of, uh, kind of uh, regardless of scale, we want to have an impact on American ag and that means working with farms big and little. Next slide. So uh, in the world of sustainable agriculture, there are three basic principles of sustainable ag. 
which is profitability over the long term, stewardship for the land and water, taking care of the environment, uh, quality of life, that's become a really important factor. And all of these three uh, main pillars of sustainable ag should be included in any grant that you propose for SARE. Uh, you need to be able to express very clearly how those ideas are integrated into the project you're doing. Next slide. <clears throat> so um, here's some of the basics about the Farmer Rancher Grant. It directly funds farmers and ranchers to explore ideas around uh, production methods and marketing uh, for products coming from your farm. So any kind of idea that you would like to explore the Sarah Farmer Rancher Grant can help you pay for it. It's, uh, you can get up to $9,000 for an individual farm, $18,000 for uh, teams of two, and $27,000 for groups of three or more. Uh, typically those grants are for a two-year project, a two-year period. You are encouraged to link with a university or a private nonprofit such as a Sustainable Farming Association on these projects. However, you are, you're not absolutely obligated to, but that is encouraged. Looks better if you do. And, um, and I would add that, you know, this is something that really the farmer is the person who writes it up and submits it. The project is coordinated overall by Joan Benjamin, who is at Lincoln University in Missouri. And um, if we can't answer a question you may have, she will. But regardless, we'll get your questions answered. Next slide. So um, from the SARE, at the SARE website, you can see a list of farmer rancher, rancher projects that have been recently funded and also going back to the beginning of SARE back in 1988. And so I have a couple of pages here of just to give you an idea of some of the different projects that have been funded recently and in the past just to help um, appreciate the variability of ideas. So for example, we have a couple on livestock, one on sheep, one on using, raising chickens. Then there's one on weed control on small farms, controlling Japanese beetles in a vineyard, uh, scaling up on farm drying equipment for elderflower. Next page. Permaculture design. Of uh, training for urban youth. And by the way, I would want to mention for sure that um, urban farming is now uh, quite a legitimate project and can be funded as well. So if you're in an urban setting and you want to apply, uh, you know, it's, you have a good chance of getting funded. And so Belgian endive, uh, local grains and fruits for craft breweries, um, and then a sh sustaining a sugar bush for maple sap production. These are just a few examples of all the different ideas people have submitted uh, to SARE and gotten funding over time. Next. So some very quickly, some things that you can't ask for in a grant. You can't ask for construction of a new building or remodeling a building. Uh, those kind of repair expenses for a permanent structure are not allowed. Uh, you can't buy motorized vehicles. Um, however, either one could be leased or rented for the duration of the project um, if needed. And you could use funds for that, but you cannot um, buy them outright. Grant funds cannot be used for permanent installations such as wells or irrigation lines. Next, Jane. Uh, so, some just uh, Q&A, these are, by the way, are also, all these uh, Q&A portions that I have right here are available for review on the uh, SARE website. So can I use funds to start my operation? Uh, no, you need to go to other places for that. Can you build a greenhouse? No, it, uh, if it is a permanent structure, no. Next slide. Um, motor vehicles, uh, tractor or riding mower, no, those cannot be covered. 
um, they could be rented or leased again uh, for the project. Now here's something interesting though, kind of an interesting twist on this, and you could uh, fund a high tunnel as long as it's um, not permanent, as long as it's movable. Uh, however, if it costs more than five grand, you need to uh, pay for half of it yourself. Only, only um, $2,500 could be used to cover the cost of the, uh, the high tunnel. Next slide. Uh, no, you cannot buy land with this. You could, however, lease or rent land. So if you have an idea and you're exploring and you uh, need land, you can actually use some of the funding to lease to help pay for rental property. Uh, the grants are taxable. So you will receive the 1099 form for the um, filed with the IRS and you'll need to report that as income. So make sure you work with a tax consultant um, you know, after you get the grant. Next one. So uh, again, um, uh, Kate and I in the Minnesota office of SARE are more than willing to review um, grant applications, grant proposals. This particular organization will also do the same. Michael Fields Agricultural Institute out of Chicago have helped a number of uh, farmers write, um, write and submit grants for uh, the Farmer Rancher Grant. So um, if you want to contact them as well, they are certainly available and more than willing to help people um, apply. And their information is on our website as well, on the SARE website. Next. So here's uh, where you would go in the SARE website to the Farmer Rancher Grant, and you can see the first red um, arrow is where you go to read the call for proposal. And um, then further down is where you would actually uh, submit, go to some, start the process. It is an online application. And so actually what I would suggest you do is uh, look at the online application because there are word limits in each section. And then I would have, have you um, write up your proposal in a Word document just to make it easier for you. And also uh, then you can do better editing of it and get the right number of words that you want to use and then submit it, uh, copy and paste into each section. That makes it go a little bit smoother. All right, next. So this is also at the, uh, this is the call for proposal. And um, again, at the SARE website. And here's the really important part. And this is due December 3rd. So um, by mail or email. And of course, you're going to be submitting it online anyway. So, um, but you've got to have it done by four o'clock on December 3rd. Now, what makes this, uh, one reason why we're doing these uh, both Minnesota farmer, uh, the demonstration grant and the farmer rancher grant today is that they are both due at about the same time. And they're both similar in nature. So you actually could write up um, in a Word document your proposal for one and then save it and use much of the same information for the other grant as well. So you kind of get a two for one out of it. Okay, next. So uh, this is the contact information for Joan Benjamin uh, at Lincoln University. And she is also, again, this information is on the North Central SARE website. Um, and again, you know, if you uh, can't reach Kate or I for whatever reason, feel free to contact Joan. But certainly we're, we're always readily, uh, readily available to answer questions and help you out with it. So next. So I'm going to talk very quickly about a, a similar grant um, called the Partnership Grant. Uh, 
It is a larger version really of the farmer rancher grant with a couple of di distinct differences. And that simply is that um, an ag professional must be involved in the grant and he, the ag professional must be the person to submit the grant. Also, it is for a, a large, potentially a larger amount of money if needed. So uh, those are key elements of it. Also, it has to have at least three farmers involved in it. So let's go ahead, uh, Jane, to the next slide. So a grant, this partnership grant could be um, $40,000 for up to two years and focusing on research or demonstration, education or marketing. It must have a team of three or four, three or more farmers or ranchers, must be led by an ag professional. Now the caveat for this year is that it's due October 22nd. So that is a couple weeks away. So it you definitely could get it done, but it's the kind of thing you really need to focus on and connect with people right away to get things rolling. Um, it can be done, there's time to, to apply, but certainly if you don't get it done this year, be thinking about this because it'll be available again next year at about the same time of, uh, same time of year. Okay, next. So examples of ag professionals. Uh, extension educators, university faculty or researchers, uh, people from private nonprofits such as uh, Sustainable Farming Association, agency staff such as Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, certified crop advisors, and ag and natural resource consultants. Okay, next. So um, it, this, this particular uh, grant has only been around for since 2015. So the uh, database is not as deep as the Farmer Ranch grant. But nonetheless, I have, a, again, a couple of pages listed here just to show you some of the different ideas that people have submitted and gotten funding for. So we're talking about um, organic farms, um, developing communication toolkits, for farmers and ranchers, transportation collaboration, um, on-farm stewardship, grower-buyer network development, um, and more on the next page. Let's go to the next page, Jane. Partnering in plant health, um, improving our, understand, our understanding of fruit tree diseases in Kansas, um, alternative fruits for cider production, artisanal meat production, um, on and on, agroforestry apprenticeship program. So you can see there are a lot of different, uh, really a lot of different ideas that people have uh, gotten funded for. Okay, next. So again, just a quick review, it's due by October 22nd, so it can be done. There's two weeks yet to make this happen. Connect with three farmers to have them be involved. And um, they each have to have their own separate farming operation. It can't be uh, three people, you know, husband and wife and son working on the same farm kind of thing. They all have to have distinct operations. Um, it is an online application. It will cover partial salary for ag professionals. It will cover on-farm research expenses, uh, educational programming afterward, some travel, et cetera. Um, and equipment expenses are limited to 5,000 or less. Okay, onward. So here is a list of the different uh, sections in each, uh, in each part of the proposal. So as you can see, it really would make sense to do this in a, after you become familiar with it online, to, to do this in a Word uh, document and then uh, submit this, you know, fill it in online afterwards after you get the parts done. 
there's a lot to it, so you would need to get started right away. I, again, I think the worst thing you can do is wait until the day before and then think that you can actually get one of these done. It, it can be done, but it's really tough to do. Next page, Jane. So just a few quick Q and A's from the um, partnership section in the SARE uh, website. Um, let's see, do farmers listed have to be known or that can they be targeted? No, the farmers already have to be known and committed to the project. They have to be able to um, write a letter of support and really know what they're talking about. We want to know that people are in, really involved as much as they can be. Uh, you can apply for more than one grant and you can receive more than one grant at a time. Um, regarding multi-state or multi-PI, uh, that's not a, be a benefit necessarily. Um, certainly the more people you have involved, I mean, typically what I, I would say is that these are projects that are in a small, ge relatively small geographic area. So um, it's more about the idea and the outline that you present rather than whether, whether or not it crosses state lines. Next. Yes, we've covered that. Can it be awarded for both partnership and RE? Yes. Um, leadership development can be part of a proposal, um, but it shouldn't be the whole proposal in and of itself. That won't fly. But uh, certainly with, um, say urban youth project or something like that, yes, it could, uh, leadership development is important, but not as a whole grant by itself. No matching funds are required. Um, prior funding, you can have received a grant before and still reapply and get another grant. If you're good at it and uh, in particular, and it shows that you've done well with the previous grant, there'll be uh, more than willing to look at what you've done in the past and consider a new application. Next one. Uh, again, matching funds not required. Um, farmers do, um, see the next question right here, would it be an appropriate project for farmers to get better on, at on-farm data collection? It certainly will. Um, the key difference is mainly the ag professional requirement. Well, yes, uh, the ag professional and three farmers being involved. And I'm going to skip this question. Let's go to the next one, Jane. The next page. Overhead is allowed so that up to 10% of total federal funds can go for administration for example, at the university or for a private nonprofit. Um, let's see. Yep, they, an organization could prevent more than one proposal. Um, a project can last longer. I mean, uh, than the two or three year time, time uh, slot projected for it. Uh, if you let us know what that you're expecting outcomes to come continue into the future from it and certainly in a way we would expect that livestock can be funded up to 50% of livestock can be covered. Uh, let's go to the next one, Jean. Um, it will cover honeybees. Um, Interesting that they're not considered livestock because some people do consider them to be livestock at this point. A beekeeper is considered a farmer. Um, it can apply for both grants. Yes, a farm and an education center. Monitoring equipment is allowed. Next. So here's the guide, the timeline for this grant. Um, due by October 22nd, applicants will be notified in February, in April, funds will be available. First report due March uh, of 2022. All right, next. So 
So some re quick reviewer comments. Um, that farmers don't seem to be truly engaged in the work or a variation is that farmers don't seem to understand the role. So, um, or letters verifying participation are all form letters. So ideally, you're going to submit a letter of support showing that you clearly know what is going on with the project and that the farmers are, the farmers are clearly involved in it, in thinking it all the way through. Um, so sometimes the outreach can be weak or uh, on the other hand, sometimes people have a really good plan and that's, a, that's certainly something we wanna see is a, a good outreach component. And then um, this one is, again, this number three is really important. Uh, you really need to address the impacts of the social, economic, and environmental aspects of sustainability. Because, you know, these projects are um, not just about your farm, but how they will affect potentially the greater community. So it's important to have those three ideas wound into you know, your, your proposal. So very quickly, I'm gonna run through these, just the bold points. Determine, I guess, first of all, if this grant is a good fit for you. Make sure you read the proposal, the call for proposal carefully. Plan ahead, uh, so start today. Even for the one that's due in December, uh, be thinking about it now and begin developing an idea and laying out a, uh, a potential program. Plan ahead on how to accomplish your project. Uh, keep the writing simple and explain terminology that you include just to make sure everybody understands what you're talking about. Next page. Measure your results. So that means gather data and uh, be, be able and prepared to report it. Uh, have a good timeline prepared and submitted with the grant. Let reviewers know when and how things are going to unfold as you go through the research um, or outreach project. Uh, involve other groups and people who can co complement your skills. So it's important to have a, you know, um, people with other, uh, other skills involved. Develop a clear outreach plan and a realistic budget and then follow the directions all the way through, it, making sure that you're responding adequately to each question, especially regarding word counts. So these are the two individuals at SARE who are involved in this grant. Uh, they ultimately, if Kate and I can't answer a question, we'll refer to them. So um, if you can't reach Kate or I for whatever reason, you can contact Beth or Rob Myers uh, but anyway, by all means, give Kate or I a call and we'll do our best to answer your questions about the partnership grant. And I think that might be it. Yes. Great. Thank you, Wayne. Um, so we had some hiccups at the beginning with technology. And I think uh, what I'll do now is ask Annie Claude to move right into her tips for good grant applications. And then we'll hear from Maureen Thomas um, right before we go into Q&A. Hey, that sounds good. Thanks, Maureen, for your flexibility. Um, I am going to try to make this, you know, concise so that we have time for you. Um, so I'm going to be going through 10 tips for um, successful grant application, specifically for these research-based grants. And I'm not the world authority on this. Um, I'm speaking from experience. I have applied for and uh, received a number of grants. I'm on six grants right now um, and applying for more this fall. I've also been a reviewer for MDA grants before, and I have helped several farmers um, apply for the Agri Sustainable Demonstration Grant, like I talked about before. Um, where I'm a technical advisor for those. So I've seen it from um, the side of an applicant and a reviewer, and that's the experience I'm speaking from today. So um, my first tip would be first, understand what the mission of the grant opportunity is and make it clear in your proposal how your project fits with that mission. So for example, 
SARE grants tend to fund projects that promote sustainable farming. So in your SARE grant application, you would definitely want to make clear how your project works towards sustainability. But if you're applying for uh, a different type of grant, such as, this is one we haven't talked about today yet, but the Agri-Crop Research Grant. This is one that is also available in the fall and farmers or researchers can apply for it. It focuses more on economics. So improving agricultural product quality, quantity, and value. So for that type of grant application, you would wanna focus on how does your project innovate towards agricultural economics and profitability versus let's say environmental sustainability. So just make sure you understand what the, the main mission of the goal is or of the grant is. Tip number two, when applying for a grant that's focused on sustainability, such as um, all of the ones that we're talking about today, read about the different aspects of sustainability. And Wayne talked about this as well. So um, become familiar with the three pillars of sustainability, which are on the SARE website and describe how your idea fits into one or more of these. And it's okay to be really blunt about that in the grant and just be clear and straightforward. So speaking of that, that leads me into my tip number three. So when you're reading, uh, when you're reading about a grant before applying it, applying to it, read through the call for proposals document uh, pretty carefully. And that'll give you the details about what the criteria are and those criteria are what the reviewers of the grant are going to be rating your proposal on. So you wanna make sure that you are following those. And in, your, in the writing of your grant, you can be really simple and direct about how your, uh, your project idea meets those criteria. You don't have to try to hide that language within the grant application. Here's an example. So if a grant's website says something like, grant projects need to show a positive effect or reduced adverse effect on the environment, in your proposal, you can say, this project will have positive effects on the environment by, for example, finding new ways to reduce fertilizer use on a blueberry farm. So you can be really straightforward like that, and that makes it easier when the reviewer is reading your grant and marking down uh, scores for you, they can easily say, all right, they, you know, they checked that box, they met that criteria, without them having to look too hard. Number four, have a really good project justification. So in basically um, every research-based uh, grant application you'll see, it's going to ask you something like, describe the justification for this project or describe um, what problem this project is trying to solve. Um, so that's called the justification. And so make sure you address the question of what current problem is this uh, grant proposal solving? Um, what might other Minnesota farmers benefit from, from hearing about your work? How is this project unique from other work? So that MDA proposal that I mentioned earlier, the sustainable demonstration grant that we talked about first, um, the criteria that's listed in that call for proposals is make sure it's unique from other projects that have already been done or are being done right now. So if, you, um, if you're looking through the green book or you're researching online, you talk to an extension educator about your idea and you find out there's another project that has just been done that's really similar to your idea, that's okay. But try to tweak your project so that there's a unique aspect to it that makes it stand apart from something that's already been done or is currently being done. And this is a, it's something you don't have to do, but it might be helpful if you can. When you're making your project justification, are there numbers or statistics out there that you can use to back up why this project is important? For instance, let's say you, uh, let's say you own a vineyard and you wanna do a project to, uh, to compare different bird management strategies because birds eat grapes and they're, they're a big problem in vineyards. Um, can you find statistics or data out there that shows how many millions of dollars grape growers lose every year due to bird damage? Something like that will help the reviewers understand why this project would be important. Step number five, have someone look over your proposal before you submit it. And all of us do this, um, egg professionals do this all the time. Whenever we write an article for the internet or whenever we write a grant proposal, we're sending it to multiple people um, to have them read it before we submit it. Um, it's, it's really important because sometimes you, the, the project may make sense in your mind, um, but maybe how it's written 
won't make sense in somebody else's mind who's not deeply familiar with the work. So it's really helpful to get other perspectives and there's nothing wrong with that. So um, somebody can look at grammatical errors and typos for one, but also they can tell you how clearly did you describe your project and how well does the proposal meet the criteria in the grant. So if you ask somebody to review your grant, you can include the, the link to the call for proposals so that they can see that and they can compare your grant application to the criteria and give you feedback on that. Um, definitely give somebody at least a week to read your proposal uh, so that they have time to get it back to you and then you have time to do any edits you need to do before you send it in before the deadline. So I would say if you're having someone review it, send it to them at least two weeks before uh, the deadline so that you have time. Um, you can ask extension educators to review a grant for you. We don't, you know, we have limited time, but we do try to help whenever we can. And as I said, I've reviewed um, grant applications for people before. Um, you can send it to another farmer who you trust, somebody who you know has written grants before, and ask them for their opinion as well. Tip number six, describe why each item in your budget is needed and how it will be used. So, um, most if not all grant applications will ask you to, to type in your, your budget and it'll ask you to itemize it. So you're gonna be listing what supplies um, do you need to buy? Uh, are you purchasing any equipment if applicable? Um, are you requesting um, like salary, especially if there's um, like university faculty or something on your grant, um, there might be a part where you need to describe will money be spent on salaries? Some grants won't allow that, some will. Um, but describe why each budget item is needed and how it will be used. This is especially important if the call for proposal actually asks you to justify each budget item. And don't, re don't assume that the reviewers will know what a piece of equipment or a supply is, um, especially if it's a technical piece that you use in your industry uh, or the crop that you grow. Um, the reviewers might not know what it is. For instance, if you're doing a weed management based proposal and you want to use a flame weeder or a propane weeder in your project, don't just write down propane weeder, describe what that is briefly so that the reviewers um, know what you'll be using it for. Tip number seven, create a project that fits within the time frame of the grant. So the MDA, um, Sustainable Agriculture Demonstration Grant that I described at the beginning, uh, it's for two to three years of funding. So when you're thinking about what project you wanna do, make sure it's something that you can actually get meaningful results from at the end of two to three years. Um, so for instance, if you wanna do a variety trial on a crop on your farm, you can do a great variety trial on something like raspberries or broccoli within two to three years because those crops will be producing in the first, second, and third years of your project. But a uh, crop like apples, where the trees can take two to three years before they start producing, that would be a really hard crop to do a variety trial on well within two to three years. So think about the time span and what you can actually accomplish by the end of it. You're gonna be writing your goals in the project proposal. So think hard about, will I be able to meet my goals within two to three seasons? Tip eight, don't go it alone. Um, you don't need to do the whole process by yourself and many grants don't let you do the process all by yourself, right? Um, some of them require you to have a technical advisor or a collaboration with um, somebody like an ag professional uh, like Wayne was describing in the Farmer Rancher Grant. So you can ask a fellow farmer to be on a grant with you. Uh, you can ask an extension educator, someone from SFA, Land Stewardship Project, Moses, etc., cetera, um, MISA to collaborate with you and here are some ways that somebody can collaborate with you on a grant. Um, the first one is maybe you think that this research proposal would be better if you were testing the technique that, that you're doing on more than one site. So maybe you have a farmer who lives three hours away from you who you're friends with and you can ask them, um, let's try this new experiment on both of our farms and it can make it a strong proposal. Um, if you've never done a field day before, extension educators and everybody else I've listed here does field days all the time. So you can ask somebody to be on your grant in the outreach component to collaborate with you on putting on a field day or, or a webinar or something. Uh, writing up your results. It can be really challenging to know how to analyze data from our projects and write it up in a way that other farmers can use it and we can help with that. Developing an experimental design. 
uh, that's something where, again, that, that can be scary and intimidating up front, and we can help with that. And getting feedback on your proposal, like I said before. Tip number nine. In your proposal, describe how the project will have impacts beyond your farm. This is really important for a lot of different grant opportunities. So um, a big question that you need to answer in your, your applications a lot of the time is, will these results help other farmers improve uh, the sustainability of uh, their farming practices? Or if it's an economics focused grant, will the results improve Minnesota's ag economy in some way? And it doesn't have to be something big and profound, but it should have some sort of impact beyond your farm. And how will you communicate the results to other farmers? That gets back to that outreach component that a lot of grant applications ask for. Are you going to do a field day? Are you going to make videos? That's a, a way that a lot of us are getting information out now that we can't have big gatherings. As we're doing a lot of videos, um, maybe try to get on a podcast or something to share your results. Um, if Is it enough to just post the results online? So. Uh, that MDA sustainable egg grant, they, you, you would be publishing your results in, in their green book, uh, which is something that's posted online and people can go on and read about your project. But it's not enough. Um, a lot of the time, it, it might not be because farmers might not know to go to the green book to, to look at research results. So what ways can you make sure your results are really genuinely getting out there? And then tip number 10. Learn about how to conduct on-farm research and to write a great research plan. And so again, uh, trying to design an experiment on your farm or some sort of study on your farm, uh, it can be really intimidating. And so you can ask for help from an extension educator or someone else um, like those groups that I listed before, um, like MISA, um, SFA, you know, so somebody in some organization who's an egg professional who's used to having to create experiments. Um, all of us who are extension educators, we have had to make a lot of experiments um, through our previous schooling. So we can help you out with this and we're happy to. Um, so, so this photo here is from a pumpkin variety trial. And uh, we were testing 20 different varieties on uh, a farm. And in this one, in order to get really good results, we wanted to randomize where the different varieties were placed in the field. And we wanted to replicate those plots. So each variety was planted in three different areas. And that helps create a better, uh, a better proposal or a better, better results from the project. So feel free to go to this link here. This is a link that Wayne sent to me. It is a guide. It's a 24 page guide that talks about how to conduct research on your farm or ranch. So I think that's a great resource to read as you're trying to write a research grant proposal. All right, that's what I've got. So Let's let Noreen go. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I, my mute wouldn't let loose. Um, yes, Noreen, if you're prepared to uh, talk about your experience with the Farmer Rancher Grant, we, we would love to hear from you. And I believe I just unmuted you. Okay, I got it now. Um, there we go. So I am a farmer in Northwest Minnesota. And what I've done is write a SARE grant, and I'm in the process right now of it. Uh, so when you write a SARE proposal, what is your dream? What is it that you would like to leave for others to look at and maybe learn from. So I find for us, it was, a, it was a, just a gift. It was a wonderful gift that we could try some different things with kind of a safety net. And for us, we went in different directions than we ever could have at a faster speed. We made connections with people that probably wouldn't have met otherwise. And we also formed some, um, actually kind of a co-op that works together uh, because of the project. One of the things when you do a project is think about time, because suddenly your 
doing another project on top of your farm. Um, so just think about that as time ways. Also think about how comfortable are you at working at the press. Uh, I had a tour going on and all of a sudden the press had saw the press release and showed up on the farm. So I was balancing farmer questions and the press and also trying to show examples. So that's one thing I didn't really see when I first submitted the grant, but it really turned out great. Um, we actually then also had a tour from senators that were passing through the area that we could actually show the project and how much we really wanted this to continue for funding. And for them to see it on the ground in action was amazing. Um, so a little tip, Stu, is to think about this time during COVID. Um, if you do have a COVID compliant tour, if you have porta potties, you know, that's expense I didn't see coming. What if you have extra phone use on your cell? Because all of a sudden you have an extra bill of, you know, $150 because you're talking to different people or connecting with different people. Um, what about your internet charges? Because all of a sudden you're using uh, wider bandwidth. So all of those things are important to kind of think about or maybe reach out to someone who's done a field day and say, you know, what was the expenditures that you didn't see coming or how did this uh, financially also, you know, impact your bottom line? Was it, you know, somebody in the family who's an accountant or that can help advise you because you don't want to have a, a bill too on, on top of that to the IRS that you didn't expect. Um, but it really truly is a gift. Um, our impact is much further reaching than I ever anticipated. And I didn't realize when I submitted the grant that the women, they happen to be all three women farmers. Well, all of a sudden we had women brewers reach out to us that said, hey, if the chain of custody remains in women's hands, well, we're, we're gonna buy from you. We would have never, ever found these people otherwise. So thank you. And any questions, I'm, I'm available for that help also. Thank you so much, Noreen. Uh, we do have some questions that came in on the registration form, and then we have one show up in the Q&A segment on this webinar. And if people have other questions that you want to put in Q&A or chat, please do. But I will start um, giving these questions to our panelists. So, the first one in the Q&A is, do you need to be able to show farm income to get any of these grants? Like, would you be able to still apply if you're in your first year of farming, so you don't have prior income to show? Oh, for the SARE grants, you don't need to show income. Okay. One of the things to think about, though, is that the money is dispersed in different increments. So you might have to personally fund some of that until you get reimbursed towards the end of the grant. So you wanna make sure you're financially stable for that as well. Um, and look at it as to its income, but you're gonna have expenditures going out as well. And um, just if you're in the middle of that where you just have the income coming in it's like December and you haven't spent it yet, you know, just to be cognizant of that. Thanks, that's a great point. Uh, Kate Seeger, if you're able to talk, um, I'm going to pitch a question about budget to you. Uh, so okay. there are, a couple, thanks. Yep, um, there are a couple questions about budget. One is how involved does the budget section need to be? Do you need firm quotes or are estimates okay? Um, I would say the estimates would probably be okay as long as you have a justification for why you have that as an estimate. Um, you know, try to get it as close as you can to the real figure and then just explain in your budget justification in the SARE grant at least why, you know, what, what your, why you think it's gonna cost that much. You can re-budget after the fact, so they do allow for changes. Okay, and then there was a question about um, breakdown of cost examples, especially examples of labor costs. And I know 
Sarah has kind of a rule of thumb for um, what farmers should put in as a labor cost. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, there is a figure. I think it's, I want to say it's $25 an hour that you should do for your labor, but that will be in the budget. Um, that'll be in the call for proposals because sometimes that does change. So be sure to check that, but they do have um, guides for how much you should be paying people in your grant. So look for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here is a question about the technical advisor, which uh, was touched on earlier, but we'll just highlight it a little bit. Um, I'm interested in learning more about the requirement to have a technical advisor and what different scenarios might look like. And Annie, maybe you could take that one. Yeah, sure. Um, so I can speak from the standpoint of the um, Agri Sustainable Demonstration Grant. Uh, I am a technical advisor on two two grants and um, my role in one is very different from my role in the other. Um, I'll put my video on. For one of the projects that I'm a technical advisor on, um, I helped write the grant proposal or, well, I reviewed the grant proposal and provided um, advice and input on it. And then I helped develop the experimental plan is a raspberry variety trial. And so we developed an experimental set up to make sure that we were going to get good data from it um, that could potentially be um, you know shared and, and maybe published down the line um, and then I will help with uh, data collection if the grower has questions about data collection and then I'll probably help with analyzing the data uh, if that's something that the grower wants um, I'll also I'm also willing to help with um, the field day that he puts on if he puts on a field day so it's not like a super hands-on thing where uh, an advisor would be there every day or anything. It's um, somebody who you can get advice from when you're developing your project and when you're implementing your project. And they might come out to your farm a couple times. They might come out to your farm 10 times, kind of depending on how much um, technical assistance you think you're going to need. Uh, on another project where I'm a technical advisor, the farmer happens to have a PhD in uh, the, the the type of crop that he's growing on his farm. So he really doesn't need a lot of uh, technical assistance from me. <laughs> and so I'm helping more in the outreach aspect of like how to get the results out there to farmers, um, how to put them into articles and, and how to do a field day kind of thing. Thank you. Um, great response. Okay, this one is kind of related uh, to the question about technical advisors and where you find them. Our farm is not located near a U of M extension office. We're in Wabasha County. We also do not have experience in on-farm research and data collection. Do you see this as a problem in conducting a grant-funded research project? Um, Wade, like you, that one. No. not sure who wants to take that one. I, you know, I'll certainly jump in on that. I, I would say that, you know, um, even though they're, they're not necessarily uh, exactly near an extension office, uh, I think it would be worthwhile to reach out to the closest um, uh, extension office in the vicinity because uh, agents do travel a lot further distance than what they used to do so. And if that turned out to be not possible, then certainly connecting with Sustainable Farming Association or Land Stewardship Project or another uh, private nonprofit that works in the area of sustainable agriculture, that would be certainly fine. You're going to need um, some help, certainly, in laying out uh, uh, you know, the goals and objectives and the actual technique for how you want to do the research uh, you're going to need that guidance or that help from somebody. And certainly, as um, you know, Annie had mentioned earlier, that, uh, that publication we have on the SARE website on how to do, how, on how to conduct research, that can help you get started. But it's always good to bounce ideas off of real human beings as well, besides reading the publication. So you'll want to get somebody involved. 
Yeah, and depending on how much you want them to be involved during the project um, or how much they, they need to be, you mm -hmm. need to have somebody close by. Like, for instance, I cover the whole state and while I don't love traveling all the time, it, it's, it's hard. Um, I do, I collaborate with farmers on projects um, and they live like ones in Alexandria, you know, and ones up in Duluth. Um, your technical advisor doesn't need to necessarily need to be uh, there all the time. So, uh, mm. yeah, and you can, if you're trying to figure out who might be in your area um, to call on, you can contact like the, the, one of the statewide specialists. Like if you're in um, livestock, uh, you could contact one of the U of M statewide livestock extension educators and they could help direct you to who a good um, person would be in your area for instance, or if you're on a fruit project, you can contact me and um, I can direct you to who a good fruit technical advisor would be in your area. Uh, Noreen, would you be able to weigh in on how you dealt with having a technical advisor who you found to help you out? Yes, with the uh, universities fairly close by, I reached out to a couple professors that were not, um, I didn't really know them. And I actually, actually had them read the proposal and asked if they would be part. Um, so it was really exciting for them because they really, uh, it was kind of creative project. So I think sometimes, you know, you're reluctant to cold call somebody, but really they, they, especially at the university system, they're really there to help and they're really, excited about new and fun ideas too. So sometimes look through, like if you're looking at um, animal husbandry or you're looking at plants, look at who that expert is. They might even have someone who is a student uh, who needs a project. You might look out that way. And they usually have, for instance, I needed malting um, machinery that's very expensive and they happen to have it at the university so we could use it at no cost. So it was a, it's reach outside your realm for those people. And once they enter your world, it's very, very helpful. Thanks. And uh, Teresa Keveny from the Sustainable Farming Association is on. Teresa, I wonder if you'd just say a word or two about the um, specialists that the Sustainable Farming Association employs and their availability to help with these kinds of projects? Sure, sometimes we are asked both to help think the project through and also to help with things related to grazing, soil health, experiments dealing with cover crops, experiments dealing with adding livestock to the landscape. Our staff includes Kent Solberg, who I think many of you know, he is our senior soil health advisor. Jared Lumen from, uh, I always forget, oh, Goodhue, excuse me, is our soil health lead. And Doug um, Voss is from Painesville and has expertise on dairy and grazing. And we also um, help, a lot of times you have to do some type of public outreach, workshop, um, field day, and we actually can teach you how to do a field day, but a lot of people can, a lot of people like Noreen who have done them are the best teachers. Um, but we can also help provide uh, outreach through our portal and so forth if we are sponsoring it or if we're involved in it. So um, it's better to contact us on the front end. Um, in fact, I think you have to contact us on the front end and not, it, it, you should have your technical advisor in place and know what their expertise is and what they have to offer. And Kent's got a ton of experience on proposals and can also even say, oh, that sounds unique, or you know what we really need is X, Y, or Z. So I hope that answers hey, your you. question, Jane. Yeah. 
Yeah, it does, and it tees up really well for the next question I'm going to put out there, which uh, several people asked similar things, so I'm going to kind of combine them. Um, there were questions about whether there are specific projects, questions, or research topics that are more desirable, or are there any that are really not of interest any longer? Um, are there particular focus areas to each round of grants or is it wide open? And are there particular areas of the state that are um, more favorable for getting funded than others? So kind of a whole bundle of questions there. And uh, Kate or Wayne, perhaps, if you'd like to start off with addressing those. Well, I would say that with the North Central SARE, certainly over the last decade or more, cover crops have been a hot topic. And uh, so those used uh, certainly in the past and up to now have been looked on very favorably uh, because obviously we all know that soil erosion is and water pollution from soil erosion is a big deal. Having said that, they certainly are open to a variety of other types of grant, um, grant proposals as well. Certainly there is the new focus on urban agriculture. And, um, you know, that, so that's uh, coming to the fore. I would also add that, uh, you know, direct marketing, marketing is always an issue for farmers. So that if you can bring a new approach, um, that's always interesting and worth looking at. And I know that uh, Sarah has, at least within the University of Minnesota, um, animal science team, I know that uh, Sarah has been criticized for not wanting to fund livestock projects, but I know that that's not really the case. We have over time funded quite a few uh, livestock projects and um, more than willing to look at them. So uh, in particular, that's, that's something I really wanna see is having, because I work in livestock, I wanna see as many livestock projects get funded as possible. So I encourage people to apply. Okay, Kate, also I'm think going poultry to... and small ruminants when you're thinking of livestock. Not it's not just cattle and dairy. Right. Okay. For sure. Uh, thank you, Kate. I'm going to pitch the last question to you. Um, there were some other questions that I'm not asking because I think they got answered well during the webinar itself. But um, what are the reporting and operating requirements? How frequently and what level of detail are the reports? Works, and how does crossover between grants work? Like if you apply for both the uh, Department of Ag Sustainable Ag Demo Grant and a SARE Farmer Rancher Grant and are awarded both of them? Um, so the reporting piece, you for SARE, I guess I can only answer that one for SARE. So I will say that you report in um, multiple times over the grant. You have to do reporting to get your um, payments. The rep I do not think the reporting is very difficult. Noreen, have, I think you've done one already so far on yours. It's an online submission. And again, Joan and I will go back and forth with you if there's some stuff missing in that and just ask you to kind of answer some questions. It's a grant program that really wants farmers to succeed in writing grants. And um, so it, they'll work with you. It's not one time only if you submit something that's it. You can go back in and edit your reports and things like that. Um, and they do know sometimes things don't work. So don't feel like you have to have success in your grant for, for it to look like success. I mean, sometimes you're going to try something and it's not going to work and that you can learn from that too. So don't be afraid to report that in your report. Um, the second part about funding, was it about funding, getting funding from both programs, Jane? Right, yeah. Um, if someone did apply for both a SARE Farmer Rancher Grant and a Sustainable Egg Demonstration Grant for, a, for essentially the same project and was awarded both of them, um, on the SARE side, how would you work with that? Would you um, ask for some modifications to kind of adjust it so it builds on the other grant or how would you deal with that? 
Yeah, I guess I would. Yeah, I guess when if that were to happen, I can't think of an example where that happened right now. But if it did, then I would contact Joan, the farmer rancher grant coordinator, and just walk it through with her and see what you would need to do. Again, you know, they really do want to work with you and make sure this succeeds. So um, just stay in touch with them as you're doing it. The other thing I would say, just kind of to backtrack to the question Wayne was answering before about um, the grants and what kind of things they look for, I would just make sure people check that database of grants funded, especially in Minnesota, and see if something similar to what you are interested in has already been funded, and then see what you could do to build on that. Um, not that they won't fund the same thing, but they would like to know that you at least look to see what had been funded before and what you could do differently or expand that research as well. Great. Thank you, Kate. Um, we are at 117 and I think we'll wrap it up. Great questions that folks submitted. Thank you so much for being on the webinar. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it was recorded and that recording will be sent out to everyone who registered and will be available on the MISA website as soon as I can get it through all the processes of uploading to YouTube and trimming and so forth. So thank you very much to all the panelists um, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks, Jane and panelists and participants. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.